time. Tea time. What is up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of Conspiracy Crime and Tea Time. I am Tara. I am solo again this week after what has seemed like an impromptu hiatus. Brittany will be back for our next episode, which I'm very excited about. Today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about the Sheffield incest case. Um, Trigger warning, rape, sexual abuse, family violence. A listener actually requested a while back ago for us to do this case. Sorry, it took us so long, or took me so long, rather. Um, so I just decided, like, let's let's knock it out. It is a very um, disturbing episode, though. So it was really hard, actually, just doing the research for it because reading this kind of stuff, like, it just oh, it, like doesn't sit right in my stomach. It gives me like the heebie-jeebies. I do not like it, but nonetheless. I'm still going to talk about it because what the fuck, right? So the Sheffield incest case uh, basically surrounds a man who is 54 years old. He was an English businessman. Um, Undetected for over a period of 25 years, he committed repeated rapes of his two daughters and fathered seven children with them. His identity has never been formally revealed to protect his daughters and their children. And to this day, he still refuses to appear in public to face up to his crimes. Um, I did read that his name has been released, like, on different forums and, and things like that. I did not honestly look that hard to find his name because with weird shit like this, it's like once you find information like you just don't know you don't know what you're gonna find on the internet like you wake up and it's been three hours and you're somehow on the dark web and then you got the fbi knocking on your door uh mm -mm. i didn't want all that it's oh yeah no anyway so basically because we i don't know his identity i don't have any like background information on this guy to determine what happened to him to make him be this disgusting person. I like to find out like the background information to see like, I don't know, like was he born this way? Maybe it's Maybelline? No, (laughs) like was he, like did something happen to him? Because you know they say with people who go on to be like a rapist or, you know, pedophiles, child molesters, things of that nature, usually it's because somebody did that to them. Not that it excuses that behavior in any way, shape, or form, but to me, it's just kind of interesting to build, like, a profile of this person, I guess. And also, I feel like maybe it makes people feel better, like, he didn't just wake up one day and decide, like, you know what? Let me ruin my kids' lives. Let me do this disgusting things. Like, it almost gives you, like, a sense of, like, okay, well, it's not me, it will never be me because I know my life, you know, you know what I'm saying? You see where I'm going? But again, not to give sympathy to him because, nah, he's a, he is like a trash can of a human being, like wholeheartedly. Um, Parallels have been drawn between him, I'm just going to refer to him as him, I guess, because I don't have a name, father, whatever. But between him and Joseph Fritzl, so Joseph Fritzl was an Austrian who uh, his daughter gave birth to seven of his children and he kept her in a dungeon for 24 years. That case came to light a few months prior to the Sheffield incest case, um, but that basically gave him the name British Fritzl. There are a lot of differences in the cases, but I guess just, you know, there's a lot of similarities as well. So most of the information that we have regarding the Sheffield incest case is from the court documents and other like public statements that have been made just because, you know, it was just the dad and the two daughters. Um, they He did have a son as well who lived with them, but 
from everything that I've read, I mean, he wasn't treated well, but um, he was never abused. But all of this stuff is just basically from the daughters telling the social workers and things of that sort. Um, one of the daughters finally revealed to a social worker that her and her sister had been kept as sex slaves of their father for years. There were a lot of local people who were puzzled because they saw these two girls and a lot of kids and they're like where are these kids coming from and they never saw any other male figures around it said that uh the dad would not let them be around people of the opposite sex like hardly ever so oh i guess his neighbors were like what is up with that um but and also all of the kids called him grandpa like not his own kids but the um children of his daughters they referred to him as grandfather. So yeah, like the neighbors were just, how how is he the grandfather when we've never seen these girls with another guy? And as we'll come to find out in this case, there has been a lot of like miscarriage of justice that has happened because so many people were very skeptical of this family and the dad um, and not a lot was done to help the girls, unfortunately. So the dad continued his abuse by frequently relocating his family to keep them isolated. They moved to almost 70 different houses. Um, they were in South Yorkshire in the early 1990s. Uh, then they went to live in a bunch of small villages in Lincolnshire, which this is in the UK. FYI, I don't think I mentioned that. So the sexual abuse of the girls began when they were 8 and 10 years old. Their mother had already left the marriage because she had suffered from abuse from the dad as well. She left her daughters and her son to live with him. Um, he was described, the dad, as being Jekyll and Hyde character. So he had like different personalities and he would get mad like at the drop of a dime. He had a one second fuse as they say. The son was forced to sleep on the floor in their apartment. Um, all of the family was very frightened of the dad. Whenever they heard his car pulling up from outside, they would like go into their own bedrooms and they were like, don't want to see dad. I have also read that the girls have said that they had to find like hiding spots whenever their dad got the like look on his face because they knew he was about to do something fucked up to them. And it's... <sighs> It's really disturbing. Whenever I'm reading stuff like this, I'm like emotionally glossing over, like plastic wrapping my feelings and just keeping them inside and just reading the facts. <laughs> Cause it, it's just like really a lot to take in. Um, I guess the dad would like call their names in the middle of the night. I read also that he was putting like blood on their doors. I don't know if that was to torment them or what exactly, uh, but he did use a lot of aggressive abuse to manipulate his children into submitting to his will. He would beat them. He would push their heads uh, close to a gas fire. So if they moved, they would be burned basically. So just like a lot of intimidation was going on to keep his children quiet um, and obedient. The rapes continued more or less every day. The victims, his daughters were too frightened to tell anyone, including their mom. Um, but again, like, I know the mom left, okay, but she had to have known something was going on, right? And she just chose to leave her kids there, like, I'm not judging her choice, but at the same time, me being a parent myself, I'm like, I would never, never, like, if you know your kids are in danger, why would you just leave them? I don't know. Um... The girls did not consider the possibility that each of them were being molested. So the dad would tell them individually, like, this is between me and you. And he made it seem like he was only doing it to one of them. But he was telling both of them that until both of the girls started getting pregnant. So then at that time, they were like, okay, what the fuck? Um, each time they became pregnant... 
the victims were taken to see a doctor, their family doctor. Uh, despite several miscarriages and terminations, no suspicion was raised and no formal, a formal action was taken. Uh, in some cases, miscarriages were covered up by the family, which I guess at that time it was just like the daughters and the son, right? Unless, I don't know, maybe they're talking about extended family whenever they were, whenever I was reading about that. Um, but yeah, one of the fetuses was flushed down the toilet and two of the elder girl's uh, babies died just before they were due. So altogether, the father's abuse led to 19 pregnancies, including five miscarriages, five terminations, and then the two children that died soon after childbirth. So altogether, seven children were born and survived the abuse. He was said to have taken pleasure in fathering the children, despite the fact that there were a lot of difficulties in the pregnancies and there were a lot of deaths. He also enjoyed inflicting the harm on his daughters. He continued raping them while they were pregnant. So he was just like a very fucking disgusting human being. Like just i it's hard, i can't even wrap my head around it like what the ah okay <laughs> so during the period that the family lived in sheffield alarm bells were going off mentally by the school um hospital and ambulance staff worried about neglect of the two girls as well as their brother because they would go to the hospital with injuries and they were basically like they they weren't doing anything. I guess they were just suspicious. But again, because the dad moved them around so much, no one really did anything. Um, at the time, some of some cases of child cruelty were still dealt with by the NSPCC, and the family were referred to the charity six times between 1975 and 1978, but no action was taken. During the early 1980s, the parents became hostile to social workers. Um, they were said that they had difficulty gaining access to the family home, and the social workers were afraid of the father, despite reports of injuries to the children and concerns over their hygiene and poor school attendance. Because they were afraid, they didn't do anything, which is so horrible. Like, you're a grown-ass adult. What do you mean you're scared of him? Like, what is he gonna, what is he really gonna do? You, like, I feel like it's a poor excuse for them to not have to do anything. They just wholeheartedly chose to look the other way while they knew these kids were being abused and not taken care of, you know. I guess maybe they didn't technically know, but you can tell. It was said that, you know, it looked like they lived in poverty and they were suffering physical abuse so on the occasions when their injuries were too obvious they were kept home from school and then the school began questioning the family and then the father at that point decided he was going to move the family to lincolnshire to escape the school scrutiny the family moved to lincolnshire in 1988 for a short period they went back to sheffield and then moved again on a more permanent basis in 1992. So between 1988 and 2002, the two girls became pregnant 16 times, with either one of them being pregnant every year or sometimes twice a year. On four occasions, the daughters were pregnant at the same time. There was increasing professional suspicion about the pregnancies, and there were seven allegations regarding incest made by professionals and even family members. The girls were asked 23 separate occasions about the paternity of their children um, by various agencies, but not one began an, uh, began an investigation or took any genetic test to determine like who the dad was. And the doctor that they would see had suggested to them like, hey, stop having kids with the person you're having kids with, which again, it's like kind of a fucked up thing to say because most of the people they're seeing, especially their family doctor, because if I'm not mistaken, they had one specific family doctor. Um, he was probably well aware what was going on. And he was like, mm, don't do that. Like, it's their fucking choice. They're not over there asking for this to happen to them. Like, come on. 
1997, the sisters had lost nine babies or pregnancies as a result of genetic disorders that could have only occurred when the gene abnormality uh, was responsible was being carried by both parents. So that is kind of a red flag as well. But again, nobody did anything. The father continued to be aggressive in all of his dealings with the authorities. Uh, the reports say professionals considered that there was nothing they could do. It just, look, it just shows. I mean, I know this is not in the United States, but things like this happen in the United States as well. And it just shows you like the systems we have put in place, they really do not help victims at all. It helps if you can prove it, but how are these girls going to prove it if they wouldn't be able to have their dad take a DNA test? Like how, how would they prove that? Those were just allegations. Um, the, the girls became so def desperate that they offered to pay their dad a hundred pounds a month to stop raping them. And that was going to be taken from their child benefit, which I don't know in the UK how exactly that works. Um, but with them offering to pay their dad the money, it gave them like a couple months of peace where he did actually stop assaulting them. But then again, it picked up after a while. Uh, when either one of the girls tried to end their sexual abuse, he threatened to kill them and their children. And when they threatened that they would tell the cops, he told them that no one would believe them. And he said that if they went public, then the children would be taken away from them. One daughter would watch the children while the other one was being assaulted. So, yeah, <laughs> like this is so typical for abusive people to do that he is planting these seeds of doubt even if these girls knew like that's probably not accurate they were not willing to risk that because they still had children regardless of the fact that he forcibly made them have kids you still would love your child either way so that's a pretty horrific thing for him to threaten them with uh, the father was said to have fathered the children incestuously in order to keep for himself the considerable amount of child support payments that were paid by the government for the welfare of the children. So that kind of like ties it all together because I mean it, it does and it doesn't because obviously he was doing it for other nefarious reasons before he started receiving the money but I think like the money was an incentivizing factor which is unfortunate because you know you can't make legislation to take welfare away from women just because someone may have forced them to have a child to take advantage of the system like like i said in the beginning this guy is just like the literal scum of the earth like a disgusting person so somehow despite the bizarre circumstances of their family situations the daughter's both uh, started dating guys. They were in relationships with them. I don't know the specifics. Like, how did that work with the dad? Because I read that he was pretty aggressive and he was not willing to let them be around men. I don't know. Maybe they got jobs or something and they met people. Who knows? But they nonetheless developed their relationships with men. And from those partners, they built up the courage to contact the authorities and accuse their father of all of his crimes. So the DNA testing was done at that point and it proved that he had fathered his children's grandchildren. Children slash grandchildren of his, I guess you could say. And that led to his conviction in Sheffield Crown Court. So he denied the allegations, of course, mind you, but then they did the DNA test and that was like, hey, you are the father. Uh, the convicted rapist was 54 years old at that time when he got convicted. Um, he offered no apology. He expressed no remorse for his actions. His lawyer basically went to court for him. He never even showed up to, like, testify, anything like that. As the extent of the ongoing crimes became clear to the authorities, they were very puzzled as to how this activity could have gone on for so long. Um, the schools, hospitals, social services, they all had missed or ignored the blatant clues that there was some sort of domestic abuse happening. Uh, like I said earlier, though, I really feel like they, 
I mean, I know there are probably some good hearted people in those institutions that really felt helpless and they probably wanted to help. But again, you know, a little too late. That's what they say, right? The, uh, what, what is the saying? The pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. That is so fitting. And that's me assuming that some of the caseworkers did have good intentions. Um, pregnancies, injuries, including bruised faces, and even more troubling, a complaint by the girl's mother that the dad had been raping him, or raping them, <laughs> had all failed to elicit an appropriate reaction and investigation by the, by the authorities, or social workers, or anybody. Um, authorities did not seem to take concern seriously when they were made aware of these situations. A police report filed by the brother of the victims was blown off by police as hearsay. And the girls themselves were unwilling to complain, to make a complaint. So that is another like whole other thing to think about too, because a lot of these people were coming forward being like, hey, please help them. But they were so manipulated and brainwashed that they were like, no, which again is so common in domestic abuse cases. Um, this one is obviously very extreme, but even still in domestic abuse cases, that is so common where like the person who is the victim does not want to come forward or speak against the person who's doing that to them for whatever reason, but mostly out of fear. Um, it's just, it's crazy. Many warning signs were present and out in the open that should have been the catalyst for some sort of protective action for the girls and their children and the criminal action against their father. But I have read that because there were so many children involved, um, a lot of the child services and things like that, they were more concerned about the welfare of the children, which is, is a good thing. Um, but that really shifted the narrative to take care of the kids as opposed to look at what was happening with the father's involvement, basically. But there were over 150 incidents identified by investigators that various authorities could have or should have taken action, but either missed or ignored. Their doctor that they would go to, their family doctor, he was actually suspended from practicing medicine due to his failure to report the abuse. I had read that the dad and him were like, cool, you know what I'm saying? They were like friends. So that's where I'm like, he probably knew exactly what was going on, but because the relationship between him and the dad, he was like, mm, I'm going to look the other way, which he shouldn't be a doctor if that's the case. That, that is disgusting. Social workers stated that because the father moved the family so often that the girls had little opportunity to form any close relationships or friendships with teachers, professionals, or anybody, uh, which that would have probably reduced the chance of the incest, uh, going on for so long but again there's no excuse because i feel like a lot of people were like completely aware of it like they totally knew what was happening um they were known to social services in both lincolnshire and south yorkshire but again the abuse was never rec uh, recognized so the dad received a 25 concurrent life he received 25 concurrent life sentences and he was required to serve a minimum of 14 and a half years in prison. His original sentence was life with a minimum period of 19 years, but it was overturned because they felt that that was excessive. That's some bullshit. Okay. <sighs> like this was in 2008. So he only has to serve 14 and a half years. Like, come on, man. Come on. There are people who sold weed who were in prison for much longer than he literally took their whole lives away from them. He took their whole lives. He forced them to become moms. He gave them incestual children, which, you know, no offense to the kids. It's not their fault, but damn, dude. And they're like, mm -hmm, 14 years is fine. No, it's not. Give him life. Give him the death the death penalty maybe look look i'm a, f a firm believer if you're a fucking disgusting pedophile i look i know this is a controversial thing thing to say but i'm like 
I don't feel like if someone is a pedophile that they're going to be able to reform their actions. I don't think that. I think it's a brain disease. I think there's something wrong with them. And I don't even think castrating them is going to be like doing the trick because they can still assault people in many other ways. Okay. I'm just saying like, <sighs> I'm not here for pedophile reform because I think it's a fucking lie. These people are deceitful. They're liars. They're manipulators. But we're going to trust that they're going to change their life around. No, they're not. No, they're not. They never do. Whew. Sorry. Getting all fired up, okay? It's just crazy. It's crazy. And I feel so bad for these girls that they had to withdur... Is that a word? They had to endure all of that for their whole lives. Like, what is that, 25 years? Jeez, man. <sighs> Very horrific. Whoever requested for us to do this, I mean, I appreciate, you know, giving the variety to us, but... This was rough. This was really hard. Hard stuff. But it's okay. Our next episode that we're going to do is actually on in the same vein, I guess you could say. We're going to be talking about Johnny Gosh. I don't know if you guys have heard of this case because my brother-in-law is the one who introduced me to this case. And it is crazy. But just to give a little synopsis, give you a little teaser... Johnny Gosh was kidnapped as a child and um, thought to have been involved with a sex trafficking ring in the 80s and 90s. I will say that because I mentioned it's on the same vein as all this gross pedophile bullshit. And the reason why my brother-in-law told me about Johnny Gosh is because I was talking to him about Pizzagate and Ghislaine Maxwell. And no, Ghislaine Maxwell, we did not forget about you. I have read that she's about to drop, uh, like she's a like she's an artist or something. She's gonna drop an album. She's about to, like, there's going to be another set of documents released. Basically, is what I've read from things or allegations that she's making against people. I'm glad she wasn't Jeffrey Epstein. I'm glad, you know, no one suicided her while in prison. I'm interested to see if she may have a smoking gun in these files because the last ones she released or they released that she told them i mean it, w it was bad but it wasn't like it wasn't shocking it was kind of like yeah we know we know this stuff okay anonymous let us know already give us something good anyway before i go on to a pizza gate tangent let me just stop there and i will just say thank you guys for listening i appreciate it and we will see you next time bye Thank you.